Hello. Um, <clears throat> so, a um, few things before I, I get started in the, the video today. Um, Burt Reynolds has passed away. Uh, he was 82 years old and was one of the best actors, you know, I'd say of his generation. Um, he was quite a dude. He had a lot of movie roles, television roles. He was just very, you know, he was a very popular actor. Um, he, I, I, from what I read, he was going to be in the new Tarantino film, and um, they said uh, within like two weeks, he was supposed to start filming his scenes, and I guess they're going to have to find a replacement. Um, it's sad. It's unfortunate. May he rest in peace. May his family and his friends, you know, take their time to mourn him and remember him. And, uh, yeah. Just wanted to get that out of the way. Um... Since, you know, the topic of today doesn't really have anything to do with Burt Reynolds, but I thought, you know, he just recently passed away. Why not just say something now? Um, and anyway, um, I have a new haircut. Um... Obviously, um, it doesn't look as good as it did before. Uh, I have been doing some things before I got here to record, so my hat do or my hair doesn't look as good. It looked a bit better than before, I think, just how it was put together, but or not put together, but just how it looked, like comb and whatnot. But yeah, I was outside. It wasn't too windy, but there was a breeze. But anyway, um, put a hat on. Because of the films and Christopher Nolan that I have left, I think this is, is very appropriate. Apologies for the shirt. It's Star Wars, not too appropriate, but, well, Darth Vader wears black, Batman wears black. So, there you go. Anyway, as I've said, the Dark Knight trilogy will be the end of this Christopher Nolan, uh, uh, like, marathon I'm having, you know, uh, of talking about movies, you know. Uh, I've talked about this trilogy before. Um, I've never gone individually with all these films. Uh, the only one I've ever really talked about on its own is The Dark Knight Rises. I will talk about that again, but those videos were mostly about me defending what criticisms people have of them and how most aren't really uh, a huge deal. You know, Some just... Uh, want to complain about something. Some just might have had a, you know, they might have had, either they hyped it up too much, or it just, you know, wasn't their cup of tea, and as a result, any little thing they see as a problem, you know, well, that's, that's going to be a huge issue for them. Other things, I just kind of went in to that movie a time or two, talking about how it's not as big of a deal, or they're not as, those problems aren't as big of a deal as many people uh, make them out to be. I might talk about that later, but, you know, next week. But now, I'm going to be talking about Batman Begins, and I also mentioned 
Dark Knight Rises because I feel you need to watch every single movie in this trilogy to truly understand all of it, especially the very end. And I think many people, you know, they, they with this movie, you know, obviously I'm going to talk about, you know, I obviously like this movie. I like this trilogy. Uh, I think if you've been watching me for some time, you kind of know that. But basically, some people say this is a flop. Um, I don't see how. It paid about $500 million, made its money back and more. Um, I want it here. I'm just going to look at how much money it made. Okay, well, $150 million and 375.2. I don't know where 500... Oh, that, that's Dunkirk, never mind. That's where that came from, but... It was a box office success. Uh, now, perhaps if the movie only made... You know... About... Uh, you know, for a... If it made, like, just its budget back in a little more, possibly it could then see, yeah, that was a box office failure. Like, since it was 150 million, maybe 200 could have been seen as a, you know, as a failure. Um, but, you know, people say that, I'm like, no, it made a lot of money. I think one thing that might have caused the fact or this movie not to make as much money as the, the later films, you know, the, the sequels to this film, was the fact that the last movie was uh, the ba last Batman film to come out was um, <clears throat> Batman and Robin. Um, and people don't like that movie. It's not good. And if anything, if it is good, it's like it's it's one of those movies that it's fun to laugh at. Um, I guess you could say it's so bad it's good, but I don't know. It's just it's not very good, in my opinion. I mean, yeah, I'll occasionally I'll laugh at it, but. It, even after a while, I mean, it's just, it's not as fun anymore. Maybe if you're having a, maybe if you're drinking or something and watching the movie, then you, I could possibly see how one could uh, potentially laugh throughout the entire thing, but um, I tried to just laugh at it, and after a while, yeah, it's real goofy and dumb, but I don't know, I just kind of got bored with it. But Batman Begins is not one of those movies. It's a very good movie. It's a great film. Um, I think it's over. It's probably the most underrated film of the trilogy. I mean, I guess you could also say The Dark Knight Rises in many ways is, you know, underrated in that it was following The Dark Knight, which was huge. Also, The Dark Knight had Heath Ledger's Joker, which is essentially iconic, and yeah, you know anything following that, it's yeah. Look, it, people had a lot of expectations, and it, it didn't meet all of them. With this film, you know, the first trailer, first teaser, you didn't really know it was a Batman movie. You know, it, uh, sure. I mean, at the very end of it, you see a glimpse of Batman, and then there you go. I remember seeing like a trailer to that in the theater, and I'm like, "Whoa, new Batman movie!" Um, I remember seeing this movie on opening day on, um, in 2005, and I had no real concept of what a reboot was. I don't think many people did. It was the kind of a new term, um, 
when Batman Begins rebooted the Batman franchise, um, it was quite uh, it was quite something. It really uh, like it redef it began to redefine the comic book genre, the superhero genre, um, and people took this character and the whole genre of superhero films a lot more seriously. Um, now people do equate that to Spider-Man of the beginning of that. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, yeah, yeah, you know, give credit where credit is due. However, when Batman begins, and especially when the Dark Knight came along and Dark Knight Rises after, it, that, this trilogy really set a certain trend of this is how, like, I guess a comic book movie should be. Um, granted, it was gritty and realistic and all that, and there are people who don't like that about this trilogy. Um, I have no problem with it. I mean, of all the characters you could ever do that with, uh, realistic and gritty, Batman's the, probably like the best superhero character, the best comic book character you could ever do that to. Because he's as realistic... Uh, as you could get. He has no superpowers. You know, he doesn't have super strength. He, I mean, he has gadgets. And he uses his brain. If anything, his, his mind is his superpower. He's really smart. Also, perhaps, his, uh, his money. I know in um, the, the new films, like Justice League, Mr. Super, I'm rich. I guess. Okay, sure. Yeah. yeah, I just... I don't know really where to begin. Well, talking about this movie. I mean, before I was just talking about the trilogy as a whole, but, you know, Christopher Nolan, you know, he did Insomnia, which was essentially how he was able to essentially get in to make this movie because, you know, it was Warner Brothers and then some of was released by Warner Brothers. And they were thinking about doing a new Batman movie and they talked to his Christopher Nolan's wife, Emma Thomas, about it. And, um, just looking at all the people in here. Quite a cast. Anyway, they, you know, they had a Warner Brothers talk to him, or talk to her, saying how, thing about making a new Batman movie, would he be, be you know, interested? She said, oh, oh, no, no, he wouldn't be interested, you know, like the kind of movies he made before, you know, there'd be no sign that Christopher Nolan would want to do a Batman movie. You know, just based on the following, Memento, Insomnia, it just wouldn't seem like, you know, the kind of thing no one would want to do. But, you know, you know, after she said that, I guess, like, they said, you know what, you just say something to him. You know, she's like, oh, okay. And she was talking to him later on and mentioned how, you know, like, you know, again, Warner Brothers said, like, you called and said how they were doing a new Batman movie, or, you know, thinking about it thought maybe you'd be interested, and I know you couldn't, I know you probably wouldn't possibly be interested, would you? And upon hearing that, no one was like, yeah, oh yeah, I've always thought there was kind of like a Batman story, you know, uh, hasn't been told before. And so from there, it's a meeting with Warner Brothers, and like one of the executives said that it was like one of the shortest meetings I remember ever having, basically. It was like 10, 15 minutes. He gave his, like, little pitch as to how he would see, you know, this new, uh, how a new Batman would be, how a new Batman movie would be. And then after that, he said, well, thank you for your time. We'll let you know what we think. And they're all just stunned and surprised, and they, they one of them said, "Well, you know, if we're gonna go with anybody, why not him?" Uh, and now Christopher Nolan, he's 
you know, he's he's even admitted, like, you know, he's not, he was never a huge comic book fan growing up, but Batman basically always intrigued him. Um, Jonathan Nolan enjoyed Batman comics, and brother gave him some comics as a kid, as a, as, as a gift. And they basically are very fascinating, like the Nolans have. And, um, yeah, Christopher Nolan, it's been very, you know, just thought the whole story, like, here's a man who, as a kid, sees something traumatizing, and then his thought was, why don't we try and tell the origin story? Because even in Tim Burton's Batman, you don't see it. It's never really addressed in the comics. All that there is is, like, uh, for, like, Seven, eight years, Bruce Wayne is away from Gotham. When he comes back, he becomes Batman, and that's it. From the time, you know, he's like eight when his parents are killed until then, there's just reference like, traveled the world for like seven, eight years, and now he's like almost 30, and he's back. In Gotham, and he's becoming Batman. What this movie does is, you know, it shows that. Um, it shows that very well. Uh, it's quite interesting, and what Christopher Nolan wanted was, you know, he's like, you know, I want the audience to care about Bruce Wayne. Be so invested with him from the beginning of the movie, when you see him as a kid, when you see him as an adult, see him go through all this, this sort of transformation occurring, to when he becomes Batman, you know, it's it's not like an anticipation thing, like where the audience is like, oh, where, where, where does he put on the suit, where does he put on the cowl and the cape and all that. He wanted to be not exactly building up, uh, Exactly, but just, you know, sort of a reward. Like, you know, we're showing you all this and care about Bruce Wayne. And now, because you care about Bruce Wayne, because you're invested in the character, because you seeing what's going on, now we're rewarded with Batman. You know, it was all worth the wait. And he didn't, might not even rec or realize you were waiting for Batman. You know, you know, Batman uh, to show up exactly. Obviously, it's called Batman Begins, but still, um, it was it was quite amazing uh, to see on the big screen and to re rewatch and revisit um, over and over again and. Um, Christian Bale. I've already talked about Christian Bale's Batman and Bruce Wayne. I love his characterization of the character. He really nails down the three personas of Batman perfectly. More than any actor I've ever seen play him. Um, you know, live action and animation. Um, other actors, in my opinion, you know, they play like two personas, like the Batman version. Obviously, that's the Batman persona, Bruce Wayne. And then there's, like, the Playboy version of Bruce Wayne. And then there's the private version of Bruce Wayne that only, like, key people, like Alfred. Uh, and this is, like, Lucius Fox. And, even, and Rachel Dawes. Like, they know this is the real Bruce Wayne. Then there's the fake Bruce Wayne. Like, the persona of the rich Playboy who's arrogant and, you know, he has that persona because nobody would ever believe that guy is Batman. A guy who dresses up, gets into a car, beats up bad guys, and then, you know, goes home and is basically sacrificing it all for Gotham. You know? No one would believe that man would be Batman. 
it just wouldn't really compute or make sense to people. Um, I think the other actors, they kind of, they try to combine the other two person, personas of Batman, like Michael Keaton, for instance. Like, he tries to be like a combination of private and playboy, sort of arrogant and truthful, down-to-earth Bruce Wayne uh, at times. And I remember someone saying they thought Michael Keaton was a bit stiff. Um, I think as Batman, exactly. Um, I don't know if it was as him as Bruce Wayne, but his performance was a stiff at times. Like as I think as Batman, just just how uh, he was playing it. Um, and with that said, well, though, that's that guy's opinion. You know, I mean, I can rewatching it, it, I can kind of see that and. To me, seeing um, Michael Keaton, he's very good. He's very good at his Batman. Um, I think Ben Affleck does a decent job. Adam West, you know, Adam West is his own Batman, you know. In a way, you could argue it's very unfair to uh, compare his Batman to Christian Bale's Batman, to Michael Keaton's Batman, to Ben Affleck's Batman. And I think fair enough. He, though Adam West uh, is my second favorite Batman. Um, that was the first Batman I ever saw as a kid. Then I saw the Tim Burton movies with Michael Keaton. And then I saw Joel Schumacher's Batman with Val Kilmer and George Clooney. I know I'm supposed to be talking about this movie, but I, I try to want to give you some sort of also my own little history with Batman as well. You know, I love Batman. Even though I probably illustrated that in other videos, I just love the character of Batman. Um, because to me, I mean, Batman was like the first thing I really latched onto on my own. I got into Star Wars because of my brothers. I enjoyed learning uh, and watching various documentaries and movies about sharks because of my brothers two things that I still enjoy to this very day, I basically, in a way, got from my brothers. You know, seeing those things constantly with them around, that was from them. To me, Batman was like the first real notable thing I latched onto on my own. Nobody else really introduced that to me either purposefully or not. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's a character I've always enjoyed. I had Batman pajamas, I had a Batman birthday kick, I had this and that. You know, I love the character of Batman and Bruce Wayne. But Batman Begins also will be a very special I always have a special place in my heart. It was the first Batman movie I ever saw on the big screen. I didn't see Batman and Robin when I was three years old in the theater. Saw it later on VHS. For a while, that was my favorite Batman movie, which is sort of ironic. Now, that's my, one of my least favorite. If not my least favorite. Actually, it is my least favorite. It's from what I can... Yeah, it is. And um, later on, a few years, even though Bad and West was my favorite Batman, just that movie, I think it was like one of the, it was very campy, sort of like it in movie form, because I hadn't seen the Batman movie. I saw reruns on like TV Land or some channel like that back then. Uh, watching the Batman TV show with Adam West. And I think that's probably why I liked Batman and Robin. I hadn't seen you know, the Adam West Batman movie yet. But um, as time went on, I watched the Tim Burton movies more. I liked those movies more. I couldn't understand why Batman and Robin, for like a couple of years, I really loved. And now I didn't like as much. 
when I saw Christopher Nolan's take, when I saw Christian Bale play Batman, this was my favorite Batman movie. Um, and quite honestly, I always wanted to see a dark version of Batman. I always wanted to see, like, I mean, yeah, I did see a dark version with Tim Burton's Batman movies, but I don't know, there's just something, uh, to me, there was something missing. Um, and it was this kind of Batman movie I wanted. Very dark and serious. Had light moments. And there are light moments in the Tim Burton movies here and there, but um, I would say those really, what some of those moments really uh, kind of belong with, you know, Jack Nicholson. And even, you know, Alfred Pennyworth, which makes sense. You know, Alfred kind of, when Batman's being serious, he might crack a joke or two to lighten the mood. While Bruce Wayne being real serious and brooding. Um, the chemistry between Alfred and uh, Bruce in here is how it should always be. That's like the comics to me. And I know many people say this doesn't really, isn't exactly like the comic version, which, obviously, fair enough, it's a realistic setting. But the characteristics of the characters are very much from the comics. It's just those characteristics or characterizations of those characters are just brought into the real world, or a more realistic world than we've ever seen uh, Batman before, you know, in a very serious manner. And with, upon seeing this, it really made me realize Batman Robin was not good. Um, I was 11 when I saw this. Um, you might say it's kind of sad. It took me from like around age 5 to 11, like 6 years or so, to realize this was not, this was, or Batman Robin was bad. And a movie like this is what Batman should be like. Uh, but, you know, I I don't know, for a good while, that was just, that was my favorite. Uh, action figures of Batman and Robin were huge. That was another thing. They had action figures for, you know, this, that I remember getting, that were cool. They were like little collectible stuff, and it was cool. Um, though, Unlike Batman and Robin, the movie didn't focus on marketing action figures, which really helps this movie. You know, again, Christian Bale, nailed Batman, Bruce Wayne. I've never had a problem with his voice. And I know people say his voice in this is the best. You should have kept it. And I've said it before, and I'll say this again. He always gave his the same voice in every film. And the next two films, they put some effect on his voice. Why? I don't know. Perhaps the idea was he, you know, wants to be even more dark and brooding. As a result, he might make his voice a bit darker. That's just speculation. I have no clue if that's even remotely the case at all. I'm not going to pretend it is. I would say only Christopher Nolan and whoever was in charge of putting that effect on his voice would know the answer on Christian Bell's voice. In the editing process, actually, because quite honestly, you can't really say that was Christian Bale's voice that was all his own. You know, upon rewatching it, and as great as those films are, it is fairly obvious an effect is used. So, yeah, there you go. There's that the whole thing on Christian Bale and his Batman. Michael Caine, excellent Alfred. Lucius Fox, played by Morgan Freeman. The first time we ever see Lucius Fox on the big screen. Great character. Shows how he 
how Bruce Wayne gets his things. And I know that's another thing. Oh, uh, he doesn't even build his own stuff. Uh, if it, hey, if Wayne Enterprises, you know, if they're uh, manufacturing and making vehicles and supplies for like military equipment and or, or military personnel, or military this and that, and they're not going to use it, why not? Why not convert that stuff into when he needs to become Batman? Also, it's interesting that Batman is afraid of bats. Or Bruce Wayne is, at least. You know, and he turns that fear into uh, something positive. Because for him, it's like, you know, why did his parents get killed? Well, he was afraid because of a play they were watching when there were people dressed as bats. And in the very beginning of the movie, he's running, playing with his friend. Like they're hiding, or he's hiding from them. And, uh, they have like an arrowhead and falls down a well. And then a the whole bunch of bats fly around him, and it's dead says some very inspiring words. Why don't we fall? So we can learn to pick ourselves up again. Or pick ourselves up. Not again, but... But, you know, stuff like that is really, really good. It makes this Batman, this version of Batman, even more interesting, in my opinion. It turns a negative... Which, you know, he, he feels it's all his fault. It's the reason his parents got killed. If he didn't get scared, they might have still been alive. They wouldn't have gone out the alley. But, you know, it's quite something. They go out the back because, I guess, you know, don't want to, I guess, make too big of a scene. Even though, I guess, if you're leaving an opera or whatever. People might see you, but I guess if you... Uh, that's something, though. I guess you can't really entirely blame Nolan or anybody from that, because, you know, there's, it, it happens in an alley. They got shot in an alley. Walking down an alley to, like, get to their car faster where they're parked or, or something. Can't entirely blame that on no. Well, that's how the that story has been. Go down an alleyway. Parents get shot and killed. Bruce Wayne sees it, traumatizes him, turns this experience into positive later in life. And um, he most certainly did. Um, and um, yeah. So Lucius Fox is amazing, you know, helps supply, you know, Bruce with the things he needs to become Batman. And, uh, yeah. And Gary Oldman, outstanding as Commissioner Gordon, you know. Christian Bale, uh, Michael Caine, and Gary Oldman, for me, will always be. Batman, Bruce Wayne, Alfred Pennyworth, and and Jim Gordon. Uh, and this movie, you know, he's, he's Captain Gordon, and at the very end, he's Lieutenant Gordon. Um, he's, he's, you know, Gary Oldman, he's fantastic. He's phenomenal. I have raved about Oldman before. I've raved about these performance in these films before. And I still will. I mean, it, it's, I mean, quite honestly, it's like, what can I say that hasn't been said about the performances here? You know, Katie Holmes, I actually like Katie Holmes. I know some people don't like her. I know critics thought that was, like, the weakest part. To me, I kind of thought Rooker Hauer was a bit of a weak link in this film. I mean, I get his, I get his character. The CEO of Wayne Enterprises, you know, because Bruce Wayne is gone for a long time. Alfred declares him legally 
dead because of how long he's been gone. But, you know, hey, he's been gone for a long time. So, company needs to be run, so, you know, he, Rooker House character, William Earl, he, you know, he takes over, and, um, yeah. Liam Neeson as Henry Ducard, or as we later find out, Raz al Ghul, or Raish al Ghul, as so many people get upset about, apparently, many people who were upset over this. But, you know. Oh, well. Actually, Gary Oldman was thought of for uh, Raz al Ghul. I'm going to call him that because that's how they pronounce him in the movie. But yeah, they he play he was offered that, but he wanted to, he didn't want to play bad guy parts, or continuously to play bad guy parts because for the nineties that's really what Oldman was known for, and um, understandably he's like I, I I don't want to continue playing parts like that, and this really helped turn his career uh, differently, you know. I mean, granted, in Harry Potter, he was serious black, but if he didn't read the books and saw the movies, in the third film, Prisoner of Azkaban, he seems to be sort of a villain. I mean, obviously, we know he isn't the villain. In the fourth movie, the Goblet of Fire of Harry Potter, you know, it's, you know, he's, he's Harry Potter's godfather. So, around this time, 2005, Oldman was playing good characters, or per characters that were good, I should say. Um, but yeah, Liam Neeson, he was really good. You know, he's known as a very a father figure. And Ken Watanabe was an inception. You know, he's the fake Ra's al Ghul. And then we see, at the very end of the movie, it turns out... Uh, Henry Ducard, you know, he's Raz al Ghul. And, uh, he wants to, you know, the plan of this is to destroy Gotham so it can be rebuilt. Like the League of Shadows, you know, that's their whole thing. Destroy certain places around the world so that they can be rebuilt. You know. Citizens will tear themselves apart. You know, some will live, and then from there, people are going to have to rebuild. They're going to have to make everything back up and make it bigger and better. Um, and um, Killian Murphy comes into play because they're using toxins from Jonathan Green or Scarecrows. Um, his uh, various toxins, like uh, the fear toxin in particular. Uh, Killian Murphy is incredible. Um, he auditioned to be Bruce Wayne in this movie. You know, he will to be Batman. <clears throat> but, you know, he liked, no one liked him so much, including his blue eyes. He thought he was, he was just very, like, enticed by his not only his acting, but his eyes, that he cast him, and he even purposely made it so that Kelly Murphy kept taking his glasses off a lot. And, um, yeah. Tom Wilkinson is Carmine Falcone, mob boss of Gotham. Fantastic job, you know. Then again, Tom Wilkinson is always great. Um, He's always incredible. Um, first time, uh, Nolan cast Christian Bale, Michael Caine, and Killian Murphy in anything, because they would later become continue to be in other movies. You know, obviously this trilogy, they're all in. All of them were in this trilogy, and they all appeared in other movies of Nolan. 
Bale and Kane and the Prestige. Um, <clears throat> Michael Caine and in Inception and Interstellar and Dunkirk and Kelly Murphy and in Inception and Dunkirk. Michael Caine's been in every single film Nolan's made since Batman Begins. Nolan says uh, Michael Caine's is good luck charm, and it seems that is true. Um, um, now, I said, mentioned how Rucker Howard's character was the weakest link, but I don't know, for me, in, these tril in this trilogy, I haven't really said a whole lot of negative things in the other movies. That I've talked about with Christopher Nolan. Though, if I was ever to criticize anything, I think it's certain characters in these trilogy, in this trilogy, like one character in each movie. In this movie, it's Rutger Howard's character, uh, you know, William Earl. I don't know. I, at times, I feel he's doing, a, he's trying his best to be a bad guy. Just a little too much, in my opinion. I mean, you can disagree. You can say, no, no, he's supposed to be like that. And fair enough. But I think at times he was a bit too, uh, trying to be a little too villainy. If that makes sense. Like, such as the line at the end of the film when they're having a meeting and uh, he wasn't notified. And he says, but, meeting. Like, I don't know, they're just the way he says it, I know that might not be a very good inflection or impression of <laughs> of him in this film, but there's something about that delivery to me that was just a bit a bit too much. Perhaps I'm... Because I'm really not looking for any kind of really nitpicks or anything like that. I guess that it would be a nitpick, honestly. But I'm not really looking for things like that to be negative about and when I go and see movies, like if something bothers me, that bothers me. Um, but I don't know, it's just something about the character of him that I don't know. And I guess it's the fact that we're not supposed to like him, and he does a good job at uh, a good job at making the audience not like him. But I don't know. I think he was a bit much at times, but. Even though the performance people often say is bad, or character as bad as Rachel in this movie, but I think Katie Holmes brought a, a naive and a naivety that's needed in this movie for that character, as well as an innocence. Um, and I don't think Maggie Gyllenhaal brought the innocence of that character into the Dark Knight, in my opinion. You might not think the character had innocence at all, but I don't know. There's just some, I think that was an appeal to me about the Rachel character. Um, about Rachel Dawes. She's an original character. Um, but, you know, William Rowe might be an original character as well. I, I don't recall such a character in the comics, though maybe he was in specific comics and I'm just not recalling him. But, yeah, there, it, but Rachel Dawes was 100% uh, a creation by Christopher Nolan and David Goyer, who helped write the movie with Nolan. And, yeah. It's just, it, I don't know. There was just something about Katie Holmes and what she brought to the character I liked. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and Hans Zimmer's music, uh, him and James Newton Howard. The music was outstanding. Uh, it's outstanding in this trilogy as a whole. But that theme, that theme to Batman is incredible. It's new. I know some people are like, why can't a constant theme always be a certain character? Like, Superman should always have that John Williams theme. Batman should always have that uh, 
you know, the Danny Elfman theme. Well, first off, uh, I think if we're all going to see what's the best uh, Batman theme, uh, it's obviously the 60s Batman, all right? Let's just get that out of the way. I mean, I love this theme. I love the score for all of them, but let's just be real. It doesn't matter how iconic that Danny Elfman score in theme may be. The 60s theme will always be more iconic. It will always triumph that score any day of the week. With that said, it's supposed to be a reboot. And again, as I said, a reboot was a new thing. Uh, nobody really knew what to exactly classify this Batman movie as, because it clearly was not a sequel to the Tim Burton Jewel Schumacher series. <clears throat> you know, it wasn't. It was a whole new film with Batman and it had a Bruce Wayne story, which I think is the best part of it. And I think, and I've said, uh, when watching The Dark Knight Rises, and then, and also hearing from Christopher Nolan that it's all about Bruce Wayne, watching these movies again really changed my perspective of how I saw them. I think that's what I kind of wanted in a way that I wasn't getting from the other Batman movies and stories. It's, it should be about Bruce Wayne and his journey as Batman. And, and there was a kind of, I think, even as a kid, wanting a, a dark, serious Batman movie, I, there was like something else I kind of wanted. I didn't know what. But when Nolan said that, and it when looking at his trilogy, it's about Bruce Wayne being Batman. That kind of clicked with me. There was something I wanted. It was, it was missing in the other interpretations of Batman. And here it was. He just told me. This is what that was. It was about Bruce Wayne. I think that's the best... I think in a way that's the best way to go about it. You should care about Bruce Wayne just as much if not possibly even more so than Batman. Because if you can't care about the man who's in the suit, Batman suit, how are you going to truly care for Batman if you can't care about Bruce Wayne <clears throat> as much as you would do as you would in these films? Um, uh, yeah, at the Oscars, um, got nominated for like cinematography I believe or the awards yep cinematography yeah maybe Christian Bale could have possibly been nominated I know I might be like what no I don't think so Bah. but you know I think he, he I think he did a great job that plays a possible consideration I guess you could say. Um, he did win like a Saturn Award <clears throat> for Best Actor in the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films Award. So, that's cool. And some awards. Yeah. Uh, going on about 50 minutes now about talking about this movie, Batman. Uh, but yeah, I just love this movie. Um, I tie it with the trilogy as my favorite Christopher Nolan um, <coughs> film. <coughs> Excuse me. And what I liked about Nolan and his approach to these films is he he took one at a time. He didn't plan exactly a, se a series of films. Early on in a documentary about the trilogy I have over there uh, in a set of 
all three of these. He says how he did yeah, early on. He and um, uh, David Goyer, you know, they flirted with the idea of it being uh, a trilogy, and no one even thought, you know. He had an idea of where he would like to see Batman end up, or Bruce Wayne end up, I should say. He had a sort of a sort of an end goal of where Bruce Wayne should be at the very end of a possible series or trilogy. Um, and for him, um, I think it's smart. He took it one at a time. Uh, I'm not sure if he implemented his plan of where he wanted Bruce Wayne to be at, at the end of uh, the potential trilogy into the Dark Knight Rises. I'm not sure. But I will not say definitely no or yes. Um, but it's kind of cool he thought of possibly uh, doing multiple movies, but then he's like, I didn't want to get ahead of myself. I mean, at the very end of the film, you know, you know the Scarecrow, so, spoiler alert, even though I've been talking about this movie and various plot points uh, at the end of the video, but, you know, Scarecrow's missing, Ra's al Ghul's dead, because Batman said, I'm not, I won't I'm not going to kill you, but I don't have to save you. Microwave emitter that's going to evaporate, evaporate the Gotham's water supply and a toxin, the fear toxin has been poured into the sewer system, so it's going to shroud Gotham in this cloud of fear and going to just tear each other apart. That plan backfired, didn't really happen. Uh, with. That didn't happen exactly with the League of Shadows. You know, they failed basically. Uh, Wayne Manor was burnt down by the League of Shadows. Kind of a bummer. But hey, in the Dark Knight gets, has a cool penthouse. So that's neat. And, um,. Yeah, we at the very end with Gordon talking to Batman, we see uh, the bat signal, which Batman kind of alluded to of having possibly <laughs> when he got Falcone and tied him up on a floodlight. Oh, another thing I want to talk about is the tumbler. Tumbler, I think, is cool. Uh, you know, the... I know some don't like it, like, oh, it's too bulky and whatever, but like, it's pretty cool. I'm not, let's just, I just want to say, if anybody had a chance to have a car like that, I think many people would go for it, honestly. Even those that say... It's not a good Batmobile. I think if they have the opportunity to have the, the Tumbler, I think many would jump out on it. Because why not? Also, what we see happen in the Dark Knight, what happens with it, it's another sort of a bonus feature with that car. And, um, suit in this movie. It's sort of standard suit, you know. Can't move his head, you know. It's pretty cool. Looking and everything. Very Batman-like. I mentioned that because later on I'll probably talk about in the next one with the Dark Knight about that the new suit he gets. But uh, yeah, in Yeah, and uh, at the very end, it alludes to the possibility of the next 
villain if ever a sequel happened, which we obviously know did. But no one, they, the people are like, oh, oh, you're kind of alluding to a sequel. Oh, you're, even though you're not planning to make a sequel exactly, you're kind of heavy. It's like, no, it's like, it's just you're living it. It's not a cliffhanger, really. You know, when you, when Gordon's telling him about this and that, and then he hands him a card about somebody going around doing things. And he turns it over, it's the Joker card. He said, it's not that it's a cliffhanger. It's not that, you know, I want people to anticipate a sequel. It's just that he wants people to want to go back to that world, you know. Or, no, not exactly go back to that world, but, oh, how did no one say it? It's... He wants people to be invested to the point where, like, they would like to know what happened. Like, it's it could be an open-ended thing. Like, what happens when he and the Joker meet? What happens when Batman and the Joker fight, or this or that? That's basically what he was saying. He wanted people to uh, just sort of like, not exactly want and expect a sequel to happen, and go back to that Gotham City. Just wonder what could happen. What could possibly happen in this incarnation of uh, Batman? Um, and it worked. I was really happy. You know, 2005, Star Wars ended. Revenge of the Sith ended. It was the last movie until, you know, ten years later, but that time didn't know that was going gonna happen um, but for me as a Batman fan a Star Wars fan it was sort of hap it was sort of like a unfortunate that Star Wars was over but it was kind of a good thing and cool that uh, here's a new Batman movie and un unspeonced Unspeonced to me. I don't think I can talk now, but basically, unknown to me and many people, it was the beginning of a trilogy. It wasn't really even known to Christopher Nolan either. Uh, sure, he might have thought of a trilogy possibly happening, but he didn't want to just set himself up and plan out. story elements here and here and there. He wanted to try to find a story each and every time that was worth telling for Batman. And he did. Batman and Bruce Wayne. And this journey that began with this movie over uh, which is now 13 years ago. It's truly a film that is worth remembering. Worth rewatching. And the influence this film had on um, not just the comic book genre, film genre, but in films as a whole cannot be you know, underestimated. I mean, the, the way James Bond is now with Daniel Craig, in a way, is as a result of Batman Begins, the Dark Knight trilogy, because... People who had Bond saw this and they're like, wow, look, this new direction they took Batman in. We could possibly do similar, do something similar to James Bond. And they did. James Bond is more realistic. And now more superhero films are more realistic because of this trilogy. Uh, possibly, uh, maybe in some regards that's good, but in others, not so good. Does Bat, does Superman and Man of Steel need to be dark and gritty? No, Superman's not like that. I mean, that doesn't really fit the character. Sure, in Batman vs. Superman you can have that because, well, you have Batman now. That stuff fits with Batman. Uh, Nolan produced Man of Steel and um, wrote the story. 
I'm not going to talk about that or the other film in the DCEU. Uh, just because, I don't know. It's not that I hate or dislike them. It's just, I don't know. I want to talk about this trilogy. Also, just to kind of wrap up uh, this Nolan filmography history of sorts. Um, but yeah, uh, it's been going on for an hour now. It's, yeah, it's really all I have to say about Batman Begins. I love it. Uh, see you all next week for the next video about the Dark Knight. I'll leave a link perhaps like some other videos I've made about the Dark Knight trilogy. The description and one of those cards. But, you know, until then, hope you have a good day, hope you have a good weekend, and yes. Just see you all next time. Bye.